And welcome. I'm Kate Breslin. I'm the president and CEO of the Schuyler Center for Analysis and Advocacy, and I am absolutely thrilled that today is here. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. And uh, my remarks will be brief because I really want to give you a chance to hear from our policy and data experts on our team. Uh, they'll introduce themselves, but I have here next to me Dee Dee Hill, Bridget Walsh, Crystal Charles, and Lara Castle. And um, I want to give a big shout out to Assemblywoman Ellen Jaffe for uh, again, again securing this room for all the other work she does <laughs> all year and especially today for securing this wonderful space for us. Um, so we're just delighted to have you all here um, and, and excited to share our, our data with you. I will tell you that it is all, I hope you grabbed a packet on your way in. It is all also available on our website, so please feel free to go there to get more, um, including all the data sources are all available on our website with good links. We, we, uh, we always want to make sure all our citations are right on. So I've been thinking as, we, um, as we're getting ready for today about um, the term upstream. Our work really tries to focus upstream. Oops. Sorry, I didn't mean to. There we go. Um, public health professionals talk about the benefits of an upstream approach. And when I was in public health school, that was one of the things that we talked about a lot. The story goes that you imagine yourself on the edge of a river, and a flailing child is drowning, and you jump in to save her. And as soon as you get her out and safe on the shore, another kid comes drowning down the river. Um, and it keeps happening. More kids drowning and more of us and more of our resources needed to pull them out. Um, some don't make it. After a while, you realize <coughs> that it's time to head upstream and figure out how to stop these kids from getting thrown into or falling in the river. Or at least, how to make sure that they are strong and resilient enough that if they do fall in, that they can swim. It's more efficient, it's more effective, and it saves lives. So what would happen if we, together, could get government policy focused upstream? We would change the trajectory for tens of thousands of children and families in the child welfare system with lasting repercussions. We would foster the development of tens of thousands of young children who currently miss out on the lifelong benefits of quality child care because it is financially out of reach. We would improve reading among the tens of thousands of four-year-olds who miss out every year on the long-term benefits of pre-K. And that's just the beginning. So some of the ways that we, right now at Schuyler Center, are focusing upstream include providing leadership to the state's child care task force charged with improving access to affordable and high-quality child care. And a big thank you to the many of you in the room who were involved with that. Um, winning state funding to recruit and support fam families for children who are in the child welfare system. We're leading a maternal depression initiative for better prevention, screening, and treatment, which will help kids and families. Um, and we're getting national and statewide recognition for preventing oral disease among children by taking an upstream and public health approach. So for today's event and this budget and legislative session, we've compiled the data We've identified opportunities for policy change, including budget investments, and we're here today to preview those for you. So I ask you to join me in uh, welcoming our fantastic policy director, Dee Dee Hill. Hello, good morning. Um, so 
as Kate said, I'm the policy director um, at Skyler Center, Center, and in that role, I coordinate all of our policy work. Um, but also because we are a small but mighty shop, um, I also um, do lead our work around family economic security uh, and also around early childhood education, particularly childcare. Um, so I'm going to focus my remarks on those um, on those areas. Um, but but first, I'm going to begin my remarks where I think I begin every year, um, which is um, to surround us in this truth that all New York children need all of these things to, to thrive, right? They need strong and economically stable families. They need healthy bodies and minds, safe homes and safe communities. Um, and they need a sound, uh, culturally responsive, age-appropriate education. Um, and I think this is important to ground all of our conversations in this every year, but perhaps more so this year when the state is facing um, a significant, uh, some significant fiscal challenges. Um, the answer to this year's budget shortfall can cannot be, should not be, um, to shift funds from one program that is essential to child and family well-being to fund another program that is essential to child and family well-being. Um, too often, that is where we find ourselves in tough budget times and sometimes not in tough budget times. And when that happens, we make no forward progress. We don't move anywhere towards our goal of enabling all New York children to thrive. Um, so all New York children need all of these things. Um, and I just also want to sort of frame things under investment in our children this year will we'll haunt our children, will we'll haunt our families, our communities, our state for decades to come. So perhaps um, the most urgent issue facing New York children um, is poverty. 20% um, of New York children live in poverty overall, uh, and due to structural inequities, that number approaches 30% among children of color. Uh, this is not a new trend. <coughs> the child poverty rate in New York State has hovered around 20% for more than a decade. Um, and to put that in a national perspective, we do not measure well. Uh, New York children are more likely to live in poverty than in 31 other states. And, and really, um, the, the measure of poverty really shouldn't be at the federal poverty level because that, that is, um, that's a measure that really defines deprivation. So 200% of poverty gets us closer to um, measuring how many children and how many families are really struggling uh, to make ends meet at the end of each month. And we look, when we look at that number, we're talking about 40% of New York children are living in families that are struggling at the end of each month. And to, to make that concrete, that's a family of three with an income of less than $43,000. So do that sort of thought exercise. Imagine trying to meet all of your financial obligations um, on that salary and also, you know, feed and clothe two kids. Um, so that's why one of our top priorities this year um, is for New York to set um, a child poverty target. Let's, let's cut child poverty in half by 2030. Let's sharply reduce racial economic inequality at least in a decade, if not faster. We could do it faster. Um, it, this really shouldn't be a heavy lift for New York. New York has the 11th strongest economy in the world. We're right behind Canada. Um, we have generally speaking, a $175 billion budget. We have the resources to tackle child poverty. Um, and targets um, are not the whole story, right? But targets would help us keep on track. We're not gonna 
We're not going to solve child poverty in one budget year. And too often, our, our thinking, our planning is in one budget year cycles, right? And that, that is not how we're going to tackle child poverty. So targets would help keep hold us to account over, over many years, from budget year to budget year. Um, targets would help us hold government to account. <laughs> so one other, another point around child poverty that is important to stress is that the younger the New York child, the more likely they are to live in poverty. Um, so in New York State, our, our children under the age of five um, <laughs> are living in poverty, 23%. Um, and this is something that we really need to take note of because um, young children actually are most vulnerable to the impacts of poverty. Um, we're excited that in the governor's state of the state last week, he, um, there, he mentioned a proposal to expand the state's child tax credit, which uh, at present omits children under the age of five, um, which is shocking considering that it's a child tax credit. Um, but, uh, but the proposal in the state of the state uh, sounds like it will fill in this gap. Um, <laughs> exactly, and Assembly Member Jaffe has been carrying legislation for a couple of years, I think, um, that has been drawing attention to this issue, to this glaring omission, and we are very excited that the governor has, has uh, made this a priority and are, we're looking forward to um, seeing the details of that proposal. Um, also uh, of critical importance to family economic security um, and also to academic readiness um, and overall well-being of our children, particularly our young children, is access to high quality child care. Um, this slide underscores um, Child care in New York and really around the country, it's not cheap. Um, and, and really, it shouldn't be, right? I mean, care, the care and education of our youngest children, we shouldn't be skimping on that. Um, but the reality, without a lot of government support, what that means is that the, the cost of child care falls mostly on the shoulders of families. Um, and as this slide suggests, it is not affordable families, low-income working families, middle-income working families cannot afford child care. Um, the average cost of care for uh, one child in center-based care is $15,000 a year. So about $1,200 a month, which means that for most families with young children, child care is their highest monthly bill. Um, so, um, and this number, where we get this number, is the federal government has pegged affordability at 10% of family income. No, no family should pay more than 10% of their income. So if we use that measure, New York families need to be making 150,000 for one child, and heaven forbid you have two or more children in childcare, you need to make a lot of money for it to be affordable. Um, and at the same time, um, our child care workforce earns near poverty wages. Um, this is what we're paying uh, our, our, first, our children's first educators. Um, and what this means for our providers um, is they are really struggling. They're really struggling to keep and retain dedicated educators, and it's not because uh, most of them want to leave the field, but many are leaving the field because they simply can't afford uh, to stay um, in the child care industry. Um, and what this is causing um, a sort of a spiral for our providers who are um, having a really tough time covering costs of 
rising wages, uh, covering other uh, costs, including rent that's increasing, insurance that's increasing, all the infrastructure expenses. Um, and then at the same time, they're having to cover the high cost of turnover. It costs a lot to find new educators to train, get them online. Um, and at the same time, New York, uh, I mean, providers, can, we, they can't ask New York families to pay anymore for the reasons the last slide highlighted, right? So the system is broken. Uh, we need to take action um, to remedy the situation. We need to do it this year. Um, okay, so solutions. Um, so there are a lot of challenges, um, but there are solutions there. Um, and, and we can, particularly if we commit in the long term, we can do this step by step. Um, but there are concrete solutions that we can and should pursue this year. Um, first, set poverty targets and let's start to meet them. One of the most effective ways to reduce child poverty is to strengthen um, refundable working family tax credits. Um, let's follow Assemblymember Jaffe and the governor's lead and let's strengthen the child tax credit, let's target um, let's target that credit to young children. Let's make sure to include children um, and families who live in deep poverty. Uh, let's be sure to include as many immigrant families as we can. Um, on the EITC, let's also fill in a gap. Young, childless adults ages 17 to 25 are currently omitted, omitted from our earned income tax credit. They are a group that struggles to get their footing in the workforce. Let's fill in that gap. Um, another solution, we need to invest in quality child care. Um, the governor convened a child care availability task force. Also legislation by the assembly member Jaffe. Um, it, it has been working hard for a year. It has been, um, the, the, the process, the conversations have been big, have been bold, have been transformation, talking about transformation. Um, we need building block investments this year in childcare. Um, and finally, um, New York is overdue to uh, fulfill its promise of expanding <laughs> pre-K to a full day pre-K for all four-year-olds across the state. New York City hit this mark. Um, it's now time for uh, New York to deliver for the rest of New York State. With that, I'm gonna turn things over to Bridget Walsh. I'm always one that has to pull the microphone down. <laughs> um, thank you, Didi. Uh, my name is Bridget Walsh. I'm the Senior Policy Analyst for Health and Public Health here at the Schuyler Center. Um, so the World Health Organization defines health as a complete state of physical, mental, and social emotional well-being and not just the absence of disease or infirmity. Looking at health through that lens, it is possible to think how broad this definition really needs to be for children. Policies that don't focus specifically on health food insecurity, stable housing, cash assistance to parents, child care, and even parenting education all relate to and support child health through that lens. It also encompasses factors that could predict a child's future health, like maternal health and well-being. It is with this lens that we view the health section of the data book and really the entire data book which leads to some spirited conversations when we're putting it together about which data point fits into what section because it really is um, a section that encompasses many of the other parts of the book. Um, let me start by saying that when it comes to health insurance coverage, there really is good news here in New York. In the early 1980s, when the national uninsurance rate for children was around 15%, and when New York implemented our first state health insurance program in 1991, the rate was around 11%. The latest report on uninsured children under age 19 from the Georgetown Center for Children and Families 
records New York as having a rate of 2.5%. Only four states have a lower rate Everyone in this room really deserves a lot of credit for that. That's an amazing amount of progress in a few decades. Um, also, more adults are now covered than any previous time, and research shows that parental insurance helps children in multiple ways, including by helping them ensure that parents are physically and emotionally healthy enough to care for their children. Having more children covered by insurance frees policymakers and advocates to look at how systems, organizational systems, workforce systems, financing and administrative systems can adapt to support services for children. At this time last year, we alluded to the data you see on this slide. And the newest report from the Georgetown Center for Children mm -hmm. and Families does show that there has been a slight but troubling increase in the number of uninsured children under six. While it's a relatively small increase, it does reverse a long-standing and positive trend. Continuous health insurance is necessary for young children to get routine care, including many of the screening programs that you see referenced in our book today, identifying problems early, and providing treatment. Coverage also protects families from medical debt, covers emergency services, and care for chronic conditions. So that while New York remains committed to coverage, this dip may be the result of actions at the federal level to deter families from enrolling eligible children in coverage. Um, it could include the heated rhetoric in the past few years around repealing the Affordable Care Act and cutting Medicaid and creating a climate of fear and confusion for in immigrant families, making them reluctant to enroll. We will watch this trend closely and intently and work with our partners to dig into causes and solutions. Hopefully this is just a short term um, change, but we'll, we'll be keeping focused on it. We don't tend to think about health in the context of families. For example, medical care, behavioral health, and dental care largely have separate service and financing systems drawn around individuals. Also, who is considered the patient is either an adult or a child, largely. And the whole world outside the healthcare sector is usually not factored into the service and financing systems. Yet, and many studies document the connectedness between parent health and child health. And this two-generation approach recognizes that a parent and a child share and are affected by living environments, which include the home and community, and parents also play a critical role in shaping a child's behavior. We need to focus additional attention on ensuring that services and systems maximize prevention and can accommodate a two-generation approach to care, whether by expanding maternal and infant <coughs> early childhood home visiting programs or supporting dyadic therapy for maternal depression. There's lots of options out there, and we have, we have to create those systems to move those forward. Fortunately, because New York has extensive insurance coverage for adults and children, these conversations are possible. We can have these policy conversations about providing care across generations to influence the outcomes for families and allow us to work extensively on eliminating structural and financial barriers to care. The early years of life set the stage for health and wellness across the lifespan. The reproduction, repercussions of poor physical and social emotional health in early childhood can extend well into adulthood. But in order to continue to move <coughs> forward and address some of the shortcomings in the data we present today, there are a few things we need to do. We need to continue the fight to protect health care coverage that we have coming with, from threats and work towards continuous coverage for adults and all children. We need to continue to expand efforts that are underway to improve early screening for developmental delays in children and maternal mental health and ensure appropriate and timely referrals as well as adequate treatment is available. There are many efforts underway in these areas that are beginning to gain traction. We need to develop universal population level strategies that have a broad impact rather than only targeting individual and families considered at risk. We also need to focus on ensuring that New York's public health infrastructure has the capacity to respond to both emergency threats and chronic challenges to health, 
This includes ensuring we have a strong, stable public health workforce and state-of-the-art data systems. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Crystal. Charles, the new policy analyst for child welfare and child poverty at Schuyler Center. Um, so I just want to read this quote out loud. I think children need to have a good environment with loving parents who inspire them and have goals for what they want to strive for. Most importantly, having fun doing things they're passionate about. So this is something we did for World Children's Day and I quickly asked my brother to text me what he <laughs> thought children need to thrive. Um, and he recently started college. Um, I think this quote speaks to how well our family, our amazing parents raised us. My family is close-knit, caring, and fun-loving. Learning about child welfare issues as a policy analyst has made me appreciate my own family even more than I already do. My role is to help ensure that all New York children have the permanent, stable families they need to thrive. New York has reduced the number of children in foster care by 71% in 23 years. This is thanks, in part, to substantial investment in preventive services. A similar level of investment in and attention to family-based services can improve health, safety, and well-being outcomes for children in foster care. <laughs> New York State has made progress in reducing the amount of children in foster care, but it has more work to do to combat the racial bias in admissions. Family separation is one of the most traumatic things a child can experience. Strengthening primary prevention can help combat the racial bias in foster care admissions. In Governor Cuomo's State of the State book, he proposes a new blind removal process where caseworkers do not disclose personal and demographic information about children or families when information about cases is being presented to key decision makers prior to removal from the home. We are pleased this proposal is in the State of the State book and the blind removal process might be a good solution to this disparity problem. While New York State places more children in need of foster care in residential settings and fewer with kin and in family-based care than the national average, New York City does better than the national average on these measures. Statewide, especially upstate, there has been a recent increase and the percentage of children in approved relative homes, otherwise known as kinship foster homes. Too few children in foster care in New York State are placed with kin, even though children placed with kin do better. When children are placed with kin, they experience less trauma and are more likely to stay in their communities of origin and with siblings, resulting in better mental and behavioral health. Children in foster care who are placed with families experience fewer placements during their time in foster care and spend less time in out-of-home care. When children in foster care are placed with kin, they experience increased permanency and continued ties to their community and culture. In the State of the State book, the governor proposes a kin-first firewall policy that mandates a second look at every child we move to ensure that all steps are taken to make the first placement, a kinship placement where appropriate. This proposal is informed by successful pilots that resulted in significant increases in kinship placements, especially in Onondaga County. If the Kin First Firewall is implemented, we may see these numbers improve in the coming years. Children who are unable to return safely to their families of origin are able to find permanency with relatives or close family friends through KinGap. As you can see, most of the discharges to KinGap are in New York City. The underuse of KinGap may be due to the fact that it does not have an independent funding stream. Counties must use money from the underfunded foster care block grant to support kinship families. 
Perhaps the new $21 million coming to New York State from the recently passed Family First Transition Act may improve these numbers, which have recently decreased. New York State can improve the lives of children and families by investing in primary prevention, strengthening and prioritizing family-based foster care, increasing support for kinship families, and expanding evidence-based prevention through the Family First Act. The last proposal in the Governor's State of the State book regarding child welfare is the new New York State AmeriCorps Foster Care Success Program. The program will give 50 youth transitioning out of foster care the opportunity to participate in one year of full-time AmeriCorps service, intensive and specialized <laughs> training, and wraparound supportive services. Participants will transition to full-time employment or academic study, having earned a federally funded scholarship that can be used for tuition, loan repayment, or other educational expenses. It is nice to see the governor discuss foster care issues in the state of the state, and we hope to see the rhetoric supported in the budget. New York State is moving in the right direction. We are looking forward to working in partnership with our colleagues and CHAMPS, Racy Age, the Foster Youth Success Alliance, the Child Welfare Coalition, and New York State government this year. Thank you. Laura <laughs> Castle. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I am Lara Castle. I am the coordinator of Medicaid Matters New York. Medicaid Matters is the statewide coalition representing the interests of people who are served by the Medicaid program. As we know, there are many competing interests in Albany when it comes to the Medicaid budget and policy making. Um, and the purpose of Medicaid Matters is to bring the interests of people to the table when it comes to budget and policy making. Um, and uh, Medicaid Matters is housed at the Schuyler Center. Um, we've been there for um, about through, uh, almost five years now. <laughs> and um, it's a really good fit because of the overlap in policy interests that we share. Um, and it's been it's been an, uh, an excellent working relationship for I think for 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 both parties. Um, with the um, with the current budget climate that we're in, um, and with the emphasis in particular on Medicaid and the escalating costs of the Medicaid program, we thought that it would be worth spending a few minutes this morning. Um, talking about Medicaid and providing some additional context as it relates to Medicaid and the state budget. Um, I'll also um, just mention that um, on the back table when you came in there was um, the Medicaid Matters statement from December um, highlighting some of our uh, thoughts and interests as it relates to this year's Medicaid budget. Um, so as you'll see on the slide, um, again, to provide some context, um, as Bridget talked about, we have um, record numbers of um, uh, low uninsurance for children in this state, um, which is a huge accomplishment. It's, it's something that New York has worked hard toward um, maintaining and something that we can really be proud of. Um, and this slide is intended to um, provide you with a little bit of detail as to where children are um, and the, um, the uh, coverage rates for um, children and families. Um, and this information was provided by uh, the Georgetown University Center for Children and Families and American Academy of Pediatrics in March of 2019. Um, they, had, they have some excellent resources, and this one in particular um, was um, state-specific snapshots. So if you're interested, um, the Georgetown CCF and, and AAP state snapshots are really quite fascinating. Um, and this, this information comes directly from, from the New York snapshot. Um, so 100% of children in foster care, 84% of children who live in or near poverty, 51% of children born to mothers, 
uh, moms who are covered by Medicaid, 50% of children with disabilities or special health care needs, and 45% of all infants, toddlers, and preschoolers. Um, also in the, in the um, March 2019 snapshot, um, this is, it, it's, it's really important to emphasize that Medicaid provides much more to a child beyond just their health. Yes, it is what allows them to stay healthy physically, um, address their, their behavioral health needs, mental health, etc. But it also means that when they are well, it can contribute to um, being able to stay in school, being able to do better in school, and all of the other things that lend to um, their health and well-being and education throughout their, their lives and into adulthood. Um, so again, this, this is another way to emphasize the importance of Medicaid coverage um, for children and families. Um, I thought it would be important to really drive home this message by pulling these um, few sentences, a couple of sentences from a Georgetown report, and I'll just read them because I think it really illustrates well what we're trying to say here. Um, uh, and as I said, Medicaid matters to children and families. Um, by making health insurance accessible to children and families, Medicaid keeps families healthy, while also protecting them from financial hardship. For millions of New Yorkers, Medicaid is a lifeline that keeps them living above the poverty line. So again, really just driving home the message that Medicaid coverage is about health and um, behavioral health and all of the other things surrounding a child, but also lends to family economic security. So my takeaways for this morning um, are really, again, to, to um, remember that Medicaid is, um, provides family economic security. Hearkening back to what Didi said at the very beginning, um, uh, it is really incumbent on us to look at children and families and the services that surround them in a very holistic way when it comes to the budget. Um, and this relates to, this, this includes thinking about the Medicaid budget as well. We have a great fear that there will be a tendency to take a little bit from this program to pay for that program. And we will be looking at that very carefully and we intend to deliver the message that um, the, the budget as a whole needs to be looked at in a holistic way so that we can provide for the universe of services and programs that children and families need. Um, also, as mentioned earlier in the presentation, it, it would be really wise to look beyond one budget year. Um, we do have a tendency, because there is the requirement to balance the budget year by year, but um, we would like to challenge the legislator and the leaders to um, do whatever they can to make smart strategic investments um, and look beyond just one budget year. And then as we say in our, um, as we said in the Medicaid Matters statement that we put out in December, it is really, really incumbent on our legislative leaders and um, policymakers to remember the intent of the Medicaid program. And that is to provide high quality, comprehensive coverage and access to services for low income people and people with disabilities. Thanks. Um, I want to give a special shout out uh, to Commissioner Poole from the Office of Children and Family Services as well as leadership from the Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance, um, Division of Criminal Justice Services and other agencies who are here as well as Assemblymember Jaffe, Assemblymember Hevesy, Assemblymember Smolin, and I'm not sure if there are other uh, elected leaders here, but um, I want to say thank you very much to all of you um, for being here. Um, you know, the decisions that our leaders make have a significant impact on people, families, neighborhoods, 
and how all of us live, grow, and age. And those decisions have a particular effect uh, for people who are living at the margins. Um, they determine you know, our, our taxes, whether we have a roof over our head, um, how public health and medical care and um, other necessities are funded, how and whether um, public infrastructure and transportation and services for the most vulnerable are funded. Um, public policy directly affects the opportunities we have and the distribution of resources to individuals and communities. It can make, policy can make the ground fertile for opportunity or it can really just um, contribute to its desolation. And as we in this room all know, it has very disparate impacts on different people. Um, so we commit to you that we will continue to focus on public policy solutions that improve the well-being of New York's most vulnerable families. Um, you know, I, I think about this sometimes. These things all sound so logical. You know, I think what we just talked about today. So what are we up against? Um, who's the opponent <laughs> to these great ideas? Well, there are many vested interests that benefit from the status quo. And we're right at that time of year right now with the state budget where um, you know, this, the 6,000 plus registered lobbyists are all here um, for their own vested interests. And I'm not, I'm not casting any aspersions, but most of those 6,000 plus registered lobbyists are not focused on low-income children and families. Um, so I, I think we all need to be. Um, and especially being mindful that a lot of these solutions are going to come about in a one-year budget period. So we need to fix some of our thinking about um, how do we account for some of the long-range impacts of the things we care about, or how do we, how do we mitigate this um, trend that often happens at this time of year where um, the budget will provide an investment in one area and then steal money away from another area. And that's why one of the things that we've been talking about that Dee Dee identified is this concept of setting some targets. And we truly believe that, that, that if we were to hold ourselves accountable to some child poverty targets, it would help us think about the long term and it could help us really look at what are the impacts when we do invest in one area that may mitigate child poverty, while at the same time we're sneaking money away from another area. So um, that's why we really think that particularly in this year where we know there, that it's going to be, the, headwind, the headwinds are against us when it comes to the budget, we think that if, if we can agree, um, uh, our policymakers and us as a community to set some targets, it'll help us to um, to measure some of those decisions that we make. Uh, we can't do this alone, and I'm so appreciative of all of you in the room, uh, all of our elected leadership. Um, we have some fantastic coalitions that we work with. You know, I don't, I, I, like I said, none of us can do this alone in this day and age. We're working um, with Raising New York to try and make sure that we're focused on those very early years when kids are especially vulnerable and where we have such fantastic opportunity to shape the trajectory um, of their lives. We're working with the Empire State Campaign for Child Care. Kids Can't Wait focused also on the early years looking at how do we make sure that kids with developmental delays and disabilities um, get the services they need when they need them and quickly. Um, winning Beginning New York, Medicaid Matters New York. We are so proud to be the home of Medicaid Matters New York. Um, and our, our, you know, we're aligned in thinking about what are the impacts of policy on the, the very human beings it affects. Um, CHAMPS, Children Need Amazing Parents, and the Child Welfare Coalition. So um, we urge you to you know, be in touch with us to talk with us about any of those. Um, oh, thank you.
and Dee Dee has, has identified for me, because, you know, I can't see. Uh, it's, <laughs> thank you, Senator Montgomery, for being here, and uh, Assemblymember Solage. Okay. Um, and apologies if I missed anybody. This is like the hard part that you don't want to <laughs> screw up. <laughs> um, so uh, we have uh, a couple of staffers who uh, have cards in case you want to ask any questions. Um, but I, I had a couple. Actually, I, you know, <laughs> I just want to tell you we had one, uh, one child care provider who emailed us last night at 930 saying she had registered for the event. She was really excited to come, but she got a call from her director last night that two people were going to be absent and she couldn't come. And it was just such a great, you know, and sad example of, um, of you know, what's happening in our child care community. Um, so, Dee Dee, can you talk a little bit about why child care is so expensive? Like, even though we all say it's not expensive because it's so important, I mean, you don't want to call it expensive, but it's expensive but worth it. And at the same time, child, the, the wages of people who provide child care are so low. Um, it, and in fact, as you talked about, I think, you know, that we're, we're experiencing a crisis that people cannot find the care that they need, sometimes even if they have the money. Um, and meanwhile, uh, yeah, Kari's going around if people have other questions. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and actually, somebody else who uh, asked this question in our office is Kari right now, who's, uh, who is the mother of two young children under the age of four. And when she saw the slide that I showed you earlier about affordability and how childcare is not affordable for anyone, she was like, oh, that's why my family is uh, scrambling to make this work right now. Um, so, you know, I, I don't have, and in fact, there are others in the room that can probably help me with, you know, why is childcare so expensive, even as um, the wages that we pay uh, our educators is so low. Um, but, you know, s some of the reasons it's so expensive is that New York has strict regulations around childcare. And, I would say appropriately so, right? Um, so we have, in particular, very low uh, educator to child uh, ratio requirements, particularly for our youngest children. Um, there's good evidence-based reasons for that, both for safety and then also to help our children thrive. Young children, they need to develop stable attachments with um, and they need to have lots of attention and lots of love and lots of guidance. So um, we, you can't outsource, even if you don't pay uh, your educators very much, um, you can't outsource uh, that, that work. So you can't cut corners there. Um, also, uh, New York State, again, appropriately, has um, strict regulations around square footage and safety and background checks and um, uh, the need for an outside area to play. So again, all of these things that are, are essential for our children to thrive in a childcare environment, um, but it doesn't come cheap. Um, so, uh, these are among the reasons that it is expensive. Um, there are probably a few others that I'm missing, but you know, as a result, and as, as Kate indicated, what this means is that it's what what we're finding is not only um, if that families can't afford childcare, even if it's in their neighborhood, um, a lot of families, even families who can afford it, can't find. Uh, Child care. We have um, in 64% uh, percent of our communities in New York State um, are called child care deserts, and that means there's no child care within, you know, within a, a reasonable distance from your home. Um, and we're finding in some communities, in fact, our friends at the Children's Agenda just released a report yesterday really looking at Rochester, the Rochester area. And they, the trend there is that child care providers are closing right and left. They cannot keep their doors open. Um, and particularly in the home-based um, sector, and that's the sector that serves most of our young children. So our babies, our toddlers. 
Um, and they, they, they just can't make um, the finances work, and that's why uh, New York really needs to prioritize investing in child care um, this year. We're not going to get across the finish line this year in sort of transforming our child care system, but we need building block investments this year, or, or we're going to have more providers close. We're going to be starting at a greater deficit um, in, in subsequent years when we, when we finally do develop a comprehensive plan. So uh, this is a question for Crystal. The, it, around one of the slides you showed was around racial disparity of children um, in the foster care system. It's shocking. Um, how does how does this impact family involvement with the foster care system? Um, so family involvement with the child, with the foster care system can honestly derail a family that was originally stable. Uh, we have um, a bunch of different intersections here um, where an investigation, even if the result is unfounded, can be very traumatizing for families. Um, we have an issue with confusing poverty with neglect, um, and that starts even from the report stage. Um, and this phenomenon often impacts single parent families. Um, and once the investigation begins, because of the relatively low threshold in New York State, a parent who has been investigated by CPS will end up flagged in the SCR system. Um, and that lasts for 18 years. Um, and this can severely impact parents' ability to find work. The, so all these different factors uh, can compound to cause um, trauma for children and families. Um, and so, as we may or may not know, the governor recently vetoed a bill that would have helped, especially with the SCR piece of this dynamic. So we're hoping that there will continue to be more work done on this and we'll see some positive change this year. Um, but as it stands, uh, an investigation process can severely... The idea is to bring together um, many different uh, sectors within the state agencies and then also outside to start to think about ways that we can support um, families um, looking at maternal mental health. Excuse me, I'm getting over a cold. So now I'm <laughs> Um, we're working on um, trying to focus um, on uh, a variety of um, policies that need to um, support maternal uh, screening um, and referral and then expanding treatment programs for, um, for mothers. And then also thinking about how that impacts um, very young children um, you know, this, this idea that um, mothers and children are, um, their, their care is intertwined, especially in the very early years. And so mothers who are unable to um, bond or completely parent a young child that has an impact on the trajectory of that child. So we're looking at um, how do we support um, um, getting better data. We, we don't have a lot of really good data, um, and this isn't just a state problem, this is really a problem ac across states and nationally. So part of the Learning Collaborative is how do we generate better data on, on maternal mental health and the impact of maternal mental health and who's getting services and what are the best services um, for families. Um, we're also looking at equity issues. This is very much an equity issue, and so we have um, an equity work group that's looking at what sort of policies and practices can close disparity gaps in maternal mental health? And what types of services and service providers could help us close um, those disparity gaps? And we're also looking at workforce identification of 
the types of providers who could be providing services, the types of training programs we need to do to expand the, um, the range of people that can help mothers, where mothers are identified, how they're referred to services, and trying to close some of those loops um, and making sure that um, uh, families through um, obstetrics, um, through uh, pediatric practices, through mental health practices are all being connected. So it's a very exciting, very challenging project. It brings in a number of, um, of uh, policy areas, um, but also a, a lot of very new partners that we've been able to talk to. So um, we have a, web, a section on our website that's devoted to the Moving on Maternal Depression Project. You'll find um, reports and some research there, um, and also some webinars. We've started to do some webinars. We're gonna be doing a very exciting set of webinars on best practices, um, trying to create a learning collaborative in New York around this topic. Um, so stay tuned for that and look on our website for um, future information on that coming up. Thank you. Laura, you, um, you referenced the Medicaid Matters Statement um, and you know, I think the, there's probably nobody in this room that hasn't heard that uh, Medicaid will be getting is and will be getting some attention this year during the budget, and there are a lot of us concerned about what that could mean. So, can you just give us sort of some of the highlights of what's you know what Medicaid Matters is thinking about? Yes, thank you. Um, so, I think first and foremost, it's important to, um, as I said, all for 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 us all to always remember the intent of the program. It is it is intended to provide coverage and access to services for people that are entitled to those care, the, that care and, and uh, coverage. Um, and so in, with the cut that just happened, there was a 1% a, a across the board cut that happened in December, and with the potential cuts in the governor's budget, um, we, we anticipate there will be some. Um, we want to remind policymakers, um, legislators, and leaders um, that we will um, will always always be voicing the interests of people and in particular in the context of cuts um, preserving eligibility and benefits first and foremost that needs to be the, the bottom line um, and then in in this um, vision that we have for 2020 our, our 2020 vision for the program going beyond protecting people from the, the cuts and the potential uh, for additional cuts, um, there are some, some fundamental things that need to stay strong in the Medicaid program, like for instance, meaningful care coordination. Um, most New Yorkers are enrolled in managed care in New York, and we need to make sure that that comes with care coordination that actually <laughs> means something to them. Um, we would love to see greater equity built into the Medicaid program um, by investing in culturally competent and community-based care and services. Um, we talk a lot about Medicaid being public money, that's, that's public dollars that ought to be spent in a transparent and accountable way and making sure, for instance, that it goes to the, the providers that are, are the safety net providers in the community that are, that are providing care and, services, care and services to people where they are. Um, and um, you know, making sure that all of this is done in a transparent way. Um, how are Medicaid dollars spent? Um, and um, in particular, um, uh, how, is the, how is the global cap used as a mechanism for discipline in the program, and what does that mean for various aspects of, of funding related to the Medicaid budget? Thank you. <coughs> so um, that concludes the formal part of our, um, of our program. We're gonna stick around though, and we're hopeful that you'll stick around and talk to each other. Um, and talk to us and we like I said we know we can't do this alone we're um, we're so appreciative to have you all here with us and um, you know Excelsior <laughs> <laughs>